are not connected by logic. Symbols are connected by association. And this is another very important process <coughs> that we will see when we come to the business of treatment. Logic does not reign in the deep levels of the mind. Down here, things are associated. See, this play up here is not his family down here. But it is an association that has happened in his mind. Another thing that has to happen is that at every one of these junctures, the feelings of pain down here have to be bound, held. So if you can imagine a structure as complex as all the jungles of the earth with all their trees, and their roots represent this basic area, and the upper level represents the human brain, which is so complex. This upper level here is so displaced away from its core in so many complex ways that it's, uh, it's almost impossible to describe, even almost impossible to grasp. But the main thing is that the surface self, the surface self, is far away and very complexly and non-logically related to the deepest self. Mm. Now, we have a problem here, because this personality structure is unstable. Now, you may say to me, Paul, if you'd ever practiced any psychotherapy at all, you'd know that the human personality is extremely stable. You can kick it around the block and it still returns to who it is, or who we are. That's true, but there's another kind of instability. Imagine that you go into your place of work one day, and nobody acknowledges your presence. People just <coughs> look right through you. And you say, hi, you know, how are you? Did you have a good evening? And they look <coughs> right through you. How long do you think it would take if we encountered 20 people or 30 people in a row that did not acknowledge we existed? How long do you think it would take before we broke down? Half an hour? An hour maybe? Maybe just five minutes? We are unstable in the sense that we require continuous validation. I'm always tempted to tell the old psychiatric joke, and I really don't know who knows it and who doesn't. There's an old psychiatric joke about two psychiatrists passing in the hallway in the morning in the hospital, and one of them says, good morning, and the other one says, I wonder what he meant by that. <laughs> you know, well, it's an old joke, and I don't know if you all know it, but the fact of the matter is that that question is more complicated in the answer than we might think. So I'm saying, and don't forget sensory deprivation chambers. How long does it take to go psychotic and start hallucinating in a sensory deprivation chamber? I don't actually know. A day, 12 hours, two days. We are, we have a potential for being we definitely have a potential uh, around the issue of, of instability. There, there are more reasons why this is unstable. One is it's a structure. And all structures that are held together or structured in the end require energy to maintain, do falter, and do fall apart. But one, it's also under great pressure. If every single one of these displacements, these displacement symbolizations, has to bind energy, and there are millions of them binding energy, binding the feelings from down here, imagine the pressure that exists in this system. And for those of us who are not perfectly parented, boy, I'm certainly one of those, this, this container becomes damaged, becomes weakened, and with all of this pressure in it, we become much more easily destabilized. Another reason why this is unstable is it's vital. The personality exists between the deepest self and the surface social self, the way the fins exist on a fish. If you cut the fins off a fish and throw it in the water, it's going to float to the top, and it's obviously going to be unable to survive. If you take the personality structure away from a human being, it's like taking the fins away from a fish. You are going to find yourself unable to function, unable to relate, unable to connect, and unable to ask for what you want. 
Fritz Perls said a fascinating thing. There are several things he said that were fascinating. And when I first heard it, it was like, boing, this light bulb went on in my head. He said, get ready for this because it's not pretty. He said, personality is the sum total of all the devices we have ever acquired to manipulate our fellow human beings. And in a sense, he's right. In a sense, the fins on that fish are manipulating the water so it can get forward, forward motion. But every time we connect with someone, we are trying to get something, and hopefully we're trying to offer something, and somehow or other, there's a, an interconnected set of processes that allow us to make a living, to have a family. So another reason why this is unstable is because it is so damn important. And in some ways, it is so very, very necessary. I've gone blank. I'll just check things out here for a minute and see where I am. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we have this fear. We have this fear of disintegration. Somebody runs a red light and you say, excuse me, I think you just went through a red light. I did not. I did not. Um, we defend ourselves. We defend ourselves um, instantly and almost uh, knee-jerk, obsessively defend ourselves because the big fear is that if we're wrong anywhere, anywhere, why we could be wrong everywhere. And if we were wrong everywhere, we could disintegrate into absolute terror. Underneath this very complicated tree is the potential to disintegrate into terror, so we maintain it at all costs. And only a few years ago, after dealing, after dealing with this all my life, I had one of these, like, awakenings. Amazing. Listen to this. The entire human brain has been designed to misrepresent itself. The entire upper structure of the social self, let me say it this way for dramatic purposes, is a lie. All surface self is a lie, in the sense that it has been displaced away from its basic truths. So we're walking around with this thing, and it is unstable. All right. If that's true, and I wouldn't lie to you, <laughs> no, I wouldn't lie to you. If that's true, then certain things follow from that. What follows from that is that we have to defend ourselves. We defend ourselves in how we move and have our being and our social being and our conversation all day long in all sorts of subtle ways. In fact, in the last eight-day intensive group I ran, and somebody in here was actually there to hear that said, somebody said on day eight, after eight solid days of agony rolling around the room from down here, instead of this stuff, somebody said, but Paul, every single thing we say is a defense. Yes, but to reach that level of acuity, you have to spend a lot of hours down here, and the more time you spend down here, the more when you're up here, you think, and you're among people, the perfectly healthy people, like me. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't kid you. All right, like me. Um, you begin to recognize very quickly that, that everything's a defense. And when I was in my own primal work, and we worked, there were 25 of us in a dark, soundproof room in the basement of an office building. And uh, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't do anything. And I realized, I know this seems a little exaggerated, but trust me, if you get into this stuff deeply enough, this is the stuff you have to deal with. I realized that when a therapist sat down beside me in the dark and in the gloom, my breathing would change. I realized that not only was everything I said a defense, even the way I breathed was a defense. It's, a, it's an awesome thing when you really start to bump into it. Okay, so given that the personality needs a lot of validation, 
given that it's under huge pressure, given that it's intrinsically dishonest, it has a lot of defending to do. All right, so how do we defend? Well, for those of you who are therapists or want to pursue this, Freud's daughter, Anna Freud, wrote a little tiny book, about that thick, called The Mental Mechanisms of Defense. And in it, she outlined, very clearly and beautifully written, she was as beautiful a writer as her dad, she outlined all these mechanisms, or, or ten of the mechanisms, and they're pretty damn complicated, and they're very, very interesting. If you want to pursue this, it's an excellent place to read. and give you a sense of being in the history of the profession. But there is one defense that exists all the time. Well, not all the time, but 99% of the time. And that is the defense of denial. We don't see.